I'm Leslie Keyes, the Director of Corporate Foundation and Government Relations here at Flagler College and the Project Director for this program. Before we get, begin the evening's opening ceremony and keynote presentation, I would like to make a few announcements. Brochures are available in the lobby providing detailed information on activities and locations for this culturally La Florida program, which runs from this evening through Sunday morning. Some of our programs are so spontaneous that opportunities are not available to recognize formally our partners and sponsors. Please refer to the listing in the brochure and at the PowerPoint, and if you have an opportunity, please thank their representatives for helping to make this program possible. Though many of our events are here in the Flagler College Auditorium, additional locations throughout the community are hosting events. The Ringhaver Student Center at Flagler College is across King Street at Sevilla Street, the Colonial Spanish Quarter on St. George Street in the heart of the Historic District will be hosting Alan Roberts and his Cracker Cattle in the DeBesa Yard. That is also where the Whip Popping Champions will perform as well tomorrow. The nation's oldest port National Heritage Area is our partner for the Spanish Maritime Legacy Program. Please note that the morning presentations will be at the Ringhaver Student Center and the afternoon programs will be at the St. Augustine Lighthouse and Museum. Your families may enjoy the boat building and the cannon conservation programs there at the museum as well. Saturday, while it is Kentucky Derby Day, <laughs> and Cinco de Mayo, we hope that you will join us for our own celebration on May 5th, that's a little more Spanish. The Great Southern Cracker Road Show, here in the auditorium from 5 to 7 p.m. Following the road show is our Native and Heritage Food Waste Seminar, orchestrated by Chef David Burrell and First Coast Technical College. We have a few reservations available for that. If you need to, send me an email at lkeys, like car keys and door keys, at flagler.edu. Our final activity will be at 11 a.m. on Sunday at the Mission de Nombres de Dios on San Marcos Avenue, where we will enjoy Mass at the Mission to appreciate the simplicity of the site where Pedro Menendez de Avilés founded St. Augustine in 1565. Though we invited Bishop Estevez, he had a little higher calling, he's at the Vatican. So fortunately, the Mass will be celebrated by Father Patrick Carroll and will be wonderful. Please join us there to close the conference in a meaningful way. Thanks to the educational partnership that Flagler College has with the Independent Colleges and Universities of Florida, or ICOF, Silver Video is taping the program this evening. Dr. Gannon's presentation can be loaded on an educational website in our classrooms. We ask that you refrain from using flash photography so our videotaping can be as effective as possible. Last but not least, please silence your cell phones. Thank you. Oh, and I did forget one announcement. And the most important, to keep the Florida, Heritage, or Florida Humanities Council happy with all of us, there are nice little green sheets. Please fill them out. You will get a different color at each session throughout the next three days. Leave them at the end of the session, send them in. But we need to know what we did well and what we could do better. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm William A. Bear, president of Flagler College. And on behalf of our entire college community, I would like to welcome you to this special program. We're very pleased that you're here, and we're very pleased to have the opportunity to host this program on our campus and throughout the city of St. Augustine. Before I tell you about the program, I, I would like to introduce Mr. John Bailey Sr., who served as mayor of St. Augustine when the city commemorated its 400th anniversary in 1965. Mr. Bailey was elected as mayor in 1962. He served as a member of the 400th Anniversary Coordinating Committee, the corporation that was responsible for the construction of the St. Augustine Amphitheater. Also, the committee developed a commemorative coin and was responsible for uh, the, the issuing of first day uh, issue stamps. They hosted several programs 
uh, initiated the cross and sword play, and also uh, established many festivals, some of which are still continuing today. The committee traveled extensively as ambassadors on behalf of the 400th anniversary. Mr. Bailey moved to St. Augustine in 1954, and since then he has been involved with many community organizations, including a member of the Board of Trustees of Flagler College, a board member of the Leitner Museum, a member of the Foundation Board of the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind, a member of the Historic Preservation Board, and a member of the Flagler Hospital Board. In 1981, Mr. Bailey was honored with the Order of La Florida, the city of St. Augustine's highest award given to recognize his outstanding achievements on behalf of his community. He was also honored by the Salvation Army as a recipient of the Gus Craig Award. One of his closest friends is our speaker, Dr. Michael Gannon, who also served on the 400th Anniversary Coordinating Committee. Accompanying Mr. Bailey is the Honorable Mark Miner, Chairman of the St. John's County Board of County Commissioners and a former Flagler College student. Mark was elected to the County Commission in 2008. He took a leave of absence to serve with the Florida National Guard in Kuwait, returning just over a year ago. He is completing his term on the Commission this year and has decided not to seek re-election. Would you please join me in welcoming Mr. Bailey and Commissioner Miner to our program this evening. Good evening. I'm uh, here tonight representing Mayor Bowles. He had another commitment and couldn't be here, so he ex extend welcome to you with this uh, inaugural meeting for the four days uh, of cultural celebration. And uh, I'd also would like to give you a little background. Bill kind of stole some of my thunder, I guess, but I can't believe it's been over uh, close to 500, I mean 50 years <laughs> ago <laughs> that we had the 400th celebration. And at that time, we had very few places to have any activity. The Ponce Hotel was still open, and so we did, were able to use that for a lot of the dignitaries that visited during that year. And uh, this building didn't exist. Flagler College didn't exist. And um, the amphitheater that he referred to was uh, built on a shoestring, I guess you'd say. We, we were able to get uh, Paul Green to do the story of the founding of Florida, St. Augustine. And uh, then uh, it, the problem was that it was, uh, it was ready for the uh, anniversary year but it didn't have a cover over it or anything, and we had a, a problem with tenants. I could ride through that park every night and tell you exactly how many people we had inside. But since then, the county has uh, spent a considerable amount of money there, making it a real venue. And uh, I want to thank Mark Miner and tell him to express our appreciation to his fellow commissioners for for doing that. I don't know whether any of you attended last night at the Beach Boys event, but they had over 4,300 people there. And uh, it was a great meeting, and I think it was filmed. And Mike Gannon, good friend from many years, was on my, the committee that we had, we called it a coordinating committee to coordinate the 400th anniversary uh, events. And uh, Mike has been a friend <coughs> since then, maybe before that for a few years. But uh, we did the best we could 
the amphitheater was built, and now you see what's there. And that was a seed, I guess, that we planted, and uh, it's, it's something to be proud of. If you haven't been there, you should go. And also, the church built the uh, cross, and, uh, it was, and the amphitheater, I might go back a little bit. I, the way we uh, raised some of the money was we uh, sold $1,000 bonds and everybody that bought them knew they weren't going to get their money back, and I don't think any of them ever got paid off. <laughs> and uh, so it was kind of on a shoestring there. And uh, I uh, flagged the college, of course, as you know, it uh, had been a real asset to this community, and I've been involved with that, as Bill said, and uh, it, it was just, uh, it had been a good run for me for all these years, and uh, I'm looking forward. I hope I will be around for the uh, 450th, and uh, I think these next few years will be exciting time for the city. And I don't know whether you're involved with any the activities that are being carried on to prepare for that or leading up to, to the time that the uh, celebration will really kick in. But I encourage if you are a, uh, I encourage you to get involved and don't be a, just a spectator, be a participator. And uh, we will end up having something um, that we can be, we're already proud of the city, but actually we can be proud of anything that we do from here on out. And uh, I uh, encourage you, if you're not involved, to please do so. And I thank, thank you for letting me speak here for just a few minutes. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here. You know, when I think about Mayor Bailey, truly a person who's dedicated their life to serving others, let's give him another round of applause. Well, St. John's County, through our Tourist Development Council, is proud to be a sponsor of Viva Florida 500. This will be a tremendous opportunity to showcase Florida's historic coast for residents and visitors alike. This public program sets the tone for a variety of exciting events scheduled to take place this year and throughout 2013. On behalf of the Tourist Development Council and the St. John's County Board of County Commissioners, welcome, thank you for coming tonight, and I hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you. I would like to recognize Adele Griffin uh, Northeast Regional Director for United States Senator Marco Rubio. Adele, there you are. Please stand and be recognized. I also bring greetings from U.S. Senator Bill Nelson, Congressman John Micah, and Jeff Atwater, Chief Financial Officer for the State of Florida, who are unable to be with us this evening. Our program, Culturally La Florida, Spain's New World Legacy will offer you a variety of opportunities to learn, experience, and share Florida's rich Spanish history. The program is part of the state's Viva Florida 500, commemoration of explorer Juan Ponce de Leon's discovery of Florida in 1513. On March 27, 1885, along St. Augustine's waterfront, just east of the plaza, the city celebrated the first Ponce de Leon Day, drawing the largest crowd ever gathered in St. Augustine. Ponce de Leon Day was held every spring for the next 45 years until the Great Depression brought a conclusion to this annual celebration after the 1930 event. It is particularly fitting that Flagler College hosts this program tonight honoring explorer Juan Ponce de Leon. Henry Flagler, founding partner with John D. Rockefeller in Standard Oil, attended that first Ponce de Leon celebration. 
And three days later, Flagler began purchasing the land on which he would build the Hotel Ponce de Leon, now Ponce de Leon Hall, the centerpiece of the Flagler College campus. And next year, parenthetically, we will celebrate the 125th anniversary of the opening of the Hotel Ponce de Leon. Our program this week is one of three being offered in, at institutions of higher education in Florida as a way to enable teachers, students, and all Floridians to develop an appreciation for the importance of Spain's influence on our state. The other locations are the University of Miami and the University of South Florida in Tampa. These programs are sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities through the Florida Humanities Council. I would also like to recognize and express appreciation to our other partners in this project, the St. Johns County Tourist Development Council and the St. Johns County Visitor and Convention Bureau, the St. Augustine Foundation, the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, the Florida Public Archaeology Network, Network the City of St. Augustine and the 450th Commemoration, and the nation's oldest Port National Heritage Area. Tonight, we are honoring a man who is legendary in Florida, the explorer Juan Ponce gracias, de Leon. Gracias, senor. Gracias. Buenas noches. What a great introduction. Señores y señoras, bienvenido. that we don't have to do all the talking oh, okay. this entire weekend. Perfecto. How lucky you are. <laughs> As I would rather hear Dr. Gannon read the phone book than me talk about my reminiscence of accomplishments. Señor, I look forward. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, gracias, señor Dios. As I started to say a few moments ago, <laughs> tonight we are honoring a man who is legendary in Florida, the explorer Juan Ponce de Leon. The most fitting person to set the tone for this culturally La Florida is another man who is legendary in Florida. Dr. Michael Gannon is Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Florida. He was born in Oklahoma, moved to St. Augustine at an early age, and attended high school in our community. He holds graduate degrees from the Catholic University in Washington, D.C., the University de Louvain in Belgium, and the University of Florida. He has written extensively about Spanish colonial history, military affairs, ethics, 
and religion. He served as a war correspondent during his military service in Vietnam. And interestingly, more than 16,000 students benefited from his knowledge and wisdom during his 36 year teaching in Florida. He has received numerous awards, including one awarded by King Juan Carlos of Spain, who honored Dr. Gannon in 1990 as Knight Commander of the Order of Isabel la Católica. In 2004, he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Florida Historical Society. In 2007, he was awarded the Order of La Florida by the City of St. Augustine. In 2010, Florida Governor Charlie Chris recognized Dr. Gannon as the state's first literary Lifetime Achievement Award winner. In that same year, Leadership Florida presented Dr. Gannon with the Leroy Collins Lifetime Achievement Award for Leadership. As was mentioned earlier, Dr. Gannon served on St. Augustine's 400th Anniversary Commemorative Commission and a half century later is serving again on the 450th Federal Commission. And as a small footnote, he celebrated his 85th birthday this last Saturday night. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Gannon. Woody Allen said that half of life is showing up. I, I think the other half is getting up. <laughs> thank you, President Hebert. And let me thank also Leslie Keyes for all the work that she's put into this, these programs. And let me recognize my academic colleagues who are here, and they're not going to learn anything from me, but uh, perhaps someone else in the hall will. And then finally, of course, there is the great uh, company that you provide this evening, and so let me say, friends. In my remarks this evening, I'd like to address the story of St. Augustine a uh, sole survivor of Spain's 16th century La Florida. And I'd like to address the story under two titles, its creation in 1565 and its recreation in 1965. We begin with the city's founder, whom you have already met this evening, Pedro Menéndez de Aviles. When on March 15, 1565, that worthy Captain General received his royal charter to establish a permanent Spanish presence in La Florida, it was not for the purpose of driving the French out of this peninsula, as is commonly assumed. The presence of French interlopers at Fort Caroline on the St. John's was not known to King Philip II or to Menendez until 11 days later. True, in light of that intelligence, the monarch supplied Menendez with additional soldiers and arms and with orders to deal with the French, quote, by whatever means you see fit, end quote. But Menendez's overriding purposes in coming here were not military. They were commercial and personal. He intended to become Florida's first great agribusinessman, mining engineer, and fisheries protector. And he wanted to search for his son Juan, who he was told had been shipwrecked somewhere along this peninsula coast. Add to that a surprisingly strong missionary impulse. What grief seizes me, he declared to Philip at court, 
when in my mind's eye I behold the wretched state of those Indians, sunk in the thickest shades of infidelity, that I should choose the settling of Florida before any other command that your majesty might bestow. Of that statement, the great American historian Francis Parkman, no friend to Spain or things Spanish, wrote in 1914, those who take this for hypocrisy do not know the Spaniard of the 16th century. Interestingly, it was this evangelical intent that was the only one to succeed. As Menendez sailed westward toward his new domain in the late summer of 1565, he had reason to ponder the geographic immensity of his new responsibilities. The La Florida, over which he was now designated Adelantado, that is, direct representative of the king, ran southward from the cod fisheries of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and northern New England, as far down the coastline as the Florida Keys, thence westward along the Gulf Coast to the Soto La Marina River in Mexico. Spanish claims to the interior lands, rising from the peregrination of Hernando de Soto in the 1540s, stretched north to Tennessee and west to the edge of Texas. Where in that vast territory would he land and build his base? The answer would come from his decision to take on the French pirates first. When that opportunity finally presented itself in early September, Menendez was gravely handicapped in doing battle. Of the 19 ships that set out with his from the Spanish port of Cadiz, only five arrived at Cape Canaveral, the Adelantado's first landfall on the continent. The remainder had been sunk or turned back by storms at sea. What success he might have against the French depended on his reaching their fort before a reinforcement fleet from France, known to be at sea, arrived at the same destination. Sailing north along the Florida coast, that is, this part of the Florida coast, and headed toward the St. John's River, Melendez sighted this inlet and river here where we are assembled this evening. Thinking well of it, he decided to return here if he needed to make a land in a hurry. Leaving aside the resulting sea and land engagements with the French, which are a story in themselves, Menendez decided that he did require a shore base within fighting distance of the French. And that is how it happened that he, with 500 soldiers, 200 sailors, four parish priests, and 100 civilian settlers, came ashore here instead of elsewhere. The date? was September 8, 1565, one year after the death of Michelangelo and one year after the birth of William Shakespeare. Menendez named the site St. Augustine after St. Augustine of Hippo, on whose feast day, August 28, he had first sighted land at Cape Canaveral. For agricultural purposes, he could not have chosen a worse location. <laughs> Early on, he found that the grains, which were staples of a Spaniard's diet, wheat, barley, rye, and oats, would not grow in the sandy, infertile coastal plain. When shipborne food stores ran out, his people began to starve. By the following January, more than 100 settlers, military and civilians, died. Unaccountably, the Spaniards refused to eat the fish and shellfish that abounded in the Matanzas River and in the nearby ocean. Historians who have studied this matter can only throw up their hands in disbelief, since who today would rather die than eat St. Augustine's shrimp pompano, flounder, stone crab, and clams. 
After disposing of the French, the settlers might have enjoyed the fruits of this new land, La Florida, had Menendez or his successors as governor moved the young city northward to a site more congenial to agriculture. It was not for lack of distance vision. Strategically, Menendez gazed as far as Newfoundland, where he planned to patrol the fishing banks. In 1566, he built his capital city, Santa Elena, at today's Paris Island, South Carolina, in the fertile Piedmont. From Santa Elena, he sent out two expeditions into the interior across the Appalachian Mountains into the Tennessee Valley. So he knew good soil. But in 1586, fearful that Santa Elena was too dangerously exposed to pirate attack, his nephew and successor, Governor Pedro Menendez Marquez, abandoned the Santa Elena site and contracted government offices and the garrison back to this spit of sand, St. Augustine, which was a curious decision in that earlier that year, St. Augustine itself had been obliterated. It was said that not even the leaves were left on the trees by the English Corsair Francis Drake. If Santa Elena was a potentially dangerous place, St. Augustine was a proven liability. In any event, as historian Eugene Lyon has written, Pedro Menendez's dream of a viable colony based on agriculture and commerce had vanished forever. Still, the survivors here who had taken refuge in the woods and the transfers from Santa Elena jointly put their shoulders to the wheel and rebuilt their first city, now also a capital. After having tried three earlier sites, one on the mainland, two on Anastasia Island, the early colonists had settled on boundaries marked off by today's Plaza, Avalese, Charlotte, and Bridge Streets. There, a complex of new offices, homes, and parish church, all of lumber and thatch construction, now took form. That there were citizens present to inhabit these buildings is owed to the fact that at last, the colonists consented for survival purposes to eat what was locally available, including seafood. In point of fact, we know exactly what they ate, thanks to the pioneering excavations in that named street-by-street -street zone by archaeologist Kathleen Deegan, who is present this evening, and two other experts in floral and faunal remains. What we find is that the Spaniards adopted the diet of the local Tamukua natives, cow, pig, deer, gopher tortoise, shark, drum, mullet, sea catfish, and the cultigens maize, beans, and squash, along with nuts, fruits, and miscellaneous greens. Households followed native food preparation techniques. Additional food, it should be mentioned, was supplied by an annual situado, or subsidy, sent at the Crown's directive from New Spain or Mexico. The Situado also included financial support for a colony that produced no wealth for itself. Contact with the Tumucua natives led to another feature of Spanish acculturation, namely marriage of soldiers to native women. When owing to the scarcity of Spanish women, men took native brides, that led to a part mestizo culture, that is, men and women of mixed races, or as Dr. Deegan describes it, this country's first melting pot. Other distinctions among the population can be drawn. Residents were predominantly criollos, creoles, persons of Spanish descent who were born in Florida or elsewhere in the Indies, the name Spain used for the Americas. About 16% of the inhabitants were peninsulares. Mostly men, they had been born in Spain, mainly Andalusia, and had migrated directly to St. Augustine from Iberia. 
Tensions between the two castes, Criollos and Peninsulares, were sharp, owing to the assumptions of superiority displayed by the Peninsulares. By 1607, when the first English colony, Jamestown, was established in what came to be called Virginia, St. Augustine had a number of accomplishments to its credit. It was home to our country's first school, first library and archives, first church, first hospital, first mission to the natives, first public market, first city plan, and first orange grove. The school was a college-level seminary for the education of Franciscan priests, members of the Order of Friars Minor, whom Menendez had brought to St. Augustine in 1573. The seminary antedated educational institutions in the later British and Dutch colonies by a half century. In the same year, 1607, King Philip III reached the conclusion that the Presidio of St. Augustine was making a contribution neither to the Spanish economy nor to the defense of the West Indies. Rather, the city had become a drain on the king's coffer and was subject to the depredations of any passing pirate. Philip therefore recommended to Pedro de Ibarra, governor at the time, that he reduce the status of St. Augustine from city to outpost replaced the army units with a corporal's guard of 150 men and dismantle the mission system. Ibarra vigorously objected that Spain should not surrender its lone significant footprint on the northern continent. But it appears that the deciding intervention came from two missionary friars, Fathers Francisco Pereja and Alonso de Peñanranda, who argued that to abandon the native Christian converts would be unthinkable. We beg your majesty, who is a most Christian king, they wrote, that you protect the Presidio and send more missionaries to answer the needs of the field. The king reluctantly consented. And there was no violence at the gates or in the streets until 1668, when one midnight, the English pirate captain Robert Searles, alias Davis, having slipped over the bar and passed the ninth wooden fort under the guise of being Spanish, deposited his men on the streets of the city, where they immediately spread death and plunder. Sixty inhabitants died. Blood was said to have run down Calle Real, Royal Street while others fled for safety into the western woods. The pirates looted residences, the governors and treasurers' houses, other public buildings, and the parish church. That gross awakening from what had been the quiet century caught the full attention of the governor and his military commander. Officers were reprimanded, sentries were discharged, and security was tightened overall on both land and sea. In April 1670, the incoming governor, Manuel de Sandoya, was presented with a more pressing challenge. On the coast of what later would be named South Carolina, the English established a settlement christened Charleston, their first serious incursion into the land south of Virginia. Sandoya recognized it as, at once as a dagger pointed at St. Augustine. King Philip V shared his alarm and transferred funds for the erection of a large stone fortress to protect the city's population. An engineer, Ignacio Daza, was sent from Havana to direct the work. Sandoya turned the first spadeful of earth on October 2nd, 1672. 23 years later, the last slab of stone was set in place. The completed edifice bore the name Castillo de San Marcos, Castle St. Mark. Just as Sindoya had feared, an English force of 600 men with an equal number of Indian allies from the Charleston region 
struck St. Augustine in November 1702. Their purpose was to wrest Florida away from Spanish rule. The then Florida governor, Josef de Zuniga y Cerda, ordered his 1,300 people into the castle with their food, animals, and most of their possessions. The English attackers sacked and looted what was left. Then, beginning November 4th, besieged the castle. For all their artillery bombardment, however, they could not breach the stone walls, which instead of shattering from the impact of the cannonballs, simply absorbed them. As one British officer complained, it was like sticking a knife into cheese. Citing a four-ship relief fleet from Cuba on the day after Christmas, the Carolinians retired from the field. In their frustration, they torched the entire board and thatch city, excepting the hospital, thus recreating the ashen wasteland left by Drake 117 years before. In the rebuilding this time, the governors turned to the shawl stone called Coquina, from which the castle had been constructed. It was stone formed by sand and billions of mollusk shells cemented together by their own lime. The existence of Coquina under the surface of North Anastasia Island had been known to the Spaniards since 1583, but without quarrying tools, it had not been utilized. After Cuba made available such tools for unearthing mollusk coquina for the Castillo, those same tools were now turned to municipal service. Slab after slab now lighted across the river for the St. August gradually became a stone city, plastered and washed inside wood plank balconies that did arabesques over the streets below. When on June 6, 1740, James Oglethorpe, governor of the newly founded English colony of Georgia, invaded the city with 1,620 men and more artillery batteries than had been placed against the Castillo 38 years earlier, he knew that burning the city to the ground was no longer an easy option. What he should have known as well was that trying conclusions with a shellstone castle was a futile effort. After five and a half weeks of ineffectual bombardment, he turned tail for Georgia. The fate of St. Augustine's first Spanish period as a capital city was decided by events far distant from the provinces of Florida. To the north, France and England contended for hegemony over the larger part of the continent. In their inevitable collision, which we call the French and Indian War, Spain, worried about English dominance over the continent, threw in her lot with France in 1761. It was a disastrous decision, for England quickly seized Havana. In the humiliating Treaty of Paris in 1763, Spain had to sacrifice Florida to England in order to regain the rich Cuban port. The Spanish flag came down St. Augustine's flagstaffs on July 20th, 1763. The 198-year first Spanish period may stand for what I am calling this evening the creation of St. Augustine. There was much history to follow, of course, a 21-year British interregnum, a 37-year Spanish restoration, a 24-year period as a United States possession and territory, a four-year period as a member of the Southern Confederacy, and 163 years as a member of the United States of America. But 1565 to 1763 were her formative years. And I turn now to what I call her recreation culminating in the quadricentennial of 1965. Fast forward with me nearly four centuries in time to March 25, 1957, 
when the St. Augustine City Commission announced, quote, to the United States and the nations of the world, quote, the year 1965 shall be the Florida celebration of the 400th anniversary of the city of St. Augustine, Florida, and that good people everywhere shall be invited to participate in this celebration. No specific actions uh, pursuant to that proclamation were undertaken until the years 1962 through 66, when seven different quadricentennial organizations either came into being or directed their interests toward the 400. The first of these was the National Quadricentennial Commission, a federal body created by President John F. Kennedy in 1963. Mr. Herbert E. Wolf, prominent St. Augustine banker and road contractor, was chosen as chairman. Other members, including national business executives, Henry Ford Jr., J. Peter Grace, and Dr. Edward H. Litchfield, chairman of the board of Smith Rona Marchant Corporation, Archbishop Joseph P. Hurley of the Catholic Diocese of St. Augustine, and Florida's two senators, Spessard Holland and George Smathers. Earl W. Newton, lately director of Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, accepted the position of executive director. In announcing the formation of the commission, President Kennedy stated that its work would form, quote, a cultural bridge to Latin America. No funding was ever appropriated to support that work. Except for a $25,000 grant secured by Senator Smathers at the behest of Chairman Wolf. One meeting of the commission took place here in St. Augustine and no further meetings appear in the record. The second group, and far more successful, was the National Park Service, represented in St. Augustine by the superintendent and staff of the Castillo de San Marcos. The NPS planned to reconstruct the Cubo Line, a defensive bulwark that extended westward from the Castillo to the city gate. Federal funds would also be secured to restore the Coquina Gate. The third organization is such society in the state whose archival holdings of documents, books, and maps were vital to the community's plans to present authentic reenactments and publications. St. Augustine, a state of Florida board created by Governor Lee Collins in 1959. Its members, appointed by the governor, represented various constituencies in St. Augustine and the state. Its original mission was to oversee reconstruction and restoration of Spanish and English colonial buildings. Chosen by the members to be executive director was the same Earl W. Newton. It was named St. Augustine's 400th Anniversary, Inc a local corporation formed by eight prominent citizens which proposed building a St. Augustine amphitheater on Anastasia Island, in which to produce an outdoor drama about the events of St. Augustine's founding year. Noted dramatist Paul Green, who had earlier written The Lost Colony, The Common Glory, and Under These Hills, would be commissioned to write an original production which Green titled Cross and Sword. The sixth of the seven uh, units or organizations was the Diocese of St. Augustine. Mission Nombre de Dios, founded in 1587, on the site where the first settlers with their pastor celebrated on September 8, 1565, the first mass in the first parish in what are now the United States and Canada, planned to erect monumental structures to observe the 400th anniversary of that religious event. The first would be a freestanding 208 foot tall stainless steel cross. The second would be a state of the art archives and library building. The third would be contemporary Coquina, a Coquina stone church to be named Prince of Peace. And the fourth connecting the other three structures would be an arching steel and concrete bridge 
over what the Spaniards call Maceras Creek. At the same time, downtown on Cathedral Place, the Cathedral of St. Augustine, built during the presidency of George Washington, would be enlarged and redecorated by a nationally ranked architect. To raise funds for those undertakings, Diocesan Archbishop Hurley sought donations from parishes in the 46 Florida counties that the diocese encompassed. And finally, number seven, uh, the St. Augustine 400th Anniversary Coordinating Committee that John Bailey described to you earlier. That committee consisted of 17 leading citizens of St. Augustine. It was established by the city commission both to promote cooperation among the various agencies engaged in quadricentennial activities and to create activities of its own. Membership represented every local constituency, business, professional, cultural, educational, ethnic, and racial. In many ways, it became the most important of the appointed bodies, owing largely to the contributions of three members. John Bailey, much respected local realtor who was chosen as chairman and who would serve as mayor commissioner during the 400th year, 1965. Major General Henry W. McMillan, Adjutant General of Florida, who with his fluency in Spanish and gracious personal manner, provided the city with an impressive spokesperson and host, and Earl W. Newton, who took on the duties here also of executive director. Enough cannot be said about the effective labors of Mr. Newton, who established contacts nationally and throughout Spain and Latin America. He was particularly successful in his travels to Spain, where he won the agreement of the Spanish government to reconstruct a residence in the historic district, as well as pledges from Spanish officials of the highest rank to visit St. Augustine during 1965. The city committee lent perfunctory support to planned ephemeral events and ceremonies. For example, a projected flight of U.S. Air Force aircraft from Aviles, Spain to MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, which never happened. Costumed reenactments of Indian, Spanish, Menorcan, and English folkways on May Day, 1965. Regular Spanish music and dancing performances in the plaza a street fiesta on North St. George Street during the evening hours of September 3rd through the 8th, 1965, flag raisings and bunting on Bay Street and the Bridge of Lions, and entertainment of visiting dignitaries. The committee approved of all of that happening, but the committee plainly offered its primary moral or financial backing to four distinct undertakings. First, reconstruction and restoration of Spanish buildings in the historic district. Two, construction of the Great Cross and library archives, bridge and Principe's Church at Mission Nombre de Dios and enlargement and decoration of the Cathedral of St. Augustine. Third, construction of the St. Augustine Amphitheater and production of the outdoor drama Cross and Sword and fourth, reconstruction of the Kubo line at the Castillo and restoration of the city gate. The committee's intent, in other words, was to help endow St. Augustine with what Andrew Carnegie called real and permanent good. Reconstruction and restoration in the historic district proceeded at a steady pace, particularly along North St. George Street where the Arivas House was the first completed structure. It was also the first and last to receive state funding. Thereafter, the reconstruction restoration effort had to depend on private gifts. Led by Mr. Newton, citizen fundraisers approached potential donors, both in state and out of state, with encouraging results. Mr. Lawrence Lewis of Richmond, Virginia, an heir of Standard Oil executive Henry Flagler, who built St. Augustine's uh, Ponce de Leon Hotel in 1887-88, contributed $1,750,000. Other, 
Other generous donors contributed lesser amounts. These included the William R. Keenan family in North Carolina, Mr. William Sims of Orlando, Mrs. Alfred I. DuPont, Mr. Ed Ball, Mr. Jacob Bryan, and Mrs. Daughtry Towers, all of Jacksonville. Then, locally, donations were made by Mr. Herbert E. Wolf, Mr. L. C. Ringhaver, Mr. John Bailey, Mr. Pierre Thompson, and Mr. John Versaggi. Thanks to the energetic initiatives of Mr. Newton, the Spanish government contributed significant funds to make possible construction of a Spanish Casa del Hidalgo, House of a Gentleman, at St. George and Hippolyta Streets. And the Organization of American States similarly funded a Pan-American building, El Centro Panamericano, on St. George Street. Certain local businesses, such as Ripley's Believe It or Not attraction, also gave support to the rest reconstruction restoration effort. As a result, by mid-1965, these amateur <coughs> homeland fundraisers, with the aid of lo local and nearby historians, archaeologists, and historic architects, had brought to life a North St. George Street that resembled a residential calle in Old Spain, or to say it another way, the St. Augustine that once was long ago. Donations that made a dozen houses and shops possible amounted to $2,380,000. Construction of the Great Cross Bridge and Church at the Mission uh, came under the direction of a Boston architectural firm named McGinnis, Walsh, and Kennedy. Archbishop Hurley, assisted by his principal fundraiser, Monsignor James Heslin, succeeded in garnering $3,750,000 for both the mission and cathedral pro projects. But that sum was not sufficient to fund both fully. The archives library building fell victim to the shortfall. But I can add, in 2009, a diocesan library archives was created in the Father Michael O'Reilly House on Avery Street. The Great Cross, honoring the site where Christianity was first permanently planted in this country, was dedicated on November 20th, 1966, by Casimiro Morcillo, Archbishop of Madrid, with participation by the Rector of Trinity Episcopal Church the pastor of Memorial Lutheran Church, the Methodist Choir of St. Augustine, the African... studios in New York City. Construction of that St. Augustine Amphitheater learning that the football New York and that the and Sword opened on schedule in June 1965 for a run of many years, June to September every year. Made Florida's official state play. In recent years, the amphitheater has been substantially enlarged and modernized, and today the 4,092-seat facility plays host to every public high school graduation and to entertainers such as the Beach Boys, James Taylor, Art Garfunkel, and Garrison Keeler, who draw fans from North Florida and South Georgia. Truly, the amphitheater, too, has proven to be a real and permanent good. The National Park Service of the Department of the Interior provided funding for the reconstruction of the Spanish log and earthen Kubo defense line 
from the Castillo west to the city gate and restoration of the city gate, closing the gate to vehicular traffic and reconfiguring the surrounding grounds. It is worth notice that accepting the federal funds that were obtained by the National Park Service, the $25,000 grant of the U.S. Senate to the National Commission, and a $50,000 annual subsidy provided in 1963 through 65 by the city and St. John's County to the Preservation Commission, all of the remaining monies used by the quadricentennial organizations was raised by St. Augustine citizens living within the city limits and without the aid of any professional fundraisers. And the total that they raised was $6,258,000. The city, th th that they deserve a, a hand. The city commission, uh, committee commissioned Barcelona artist sculptor Enrique Monjo to create a 400th anniversary medallion that could be sold to raise funds for the quadricentennial. Five copies of his design were minted in gold for presentation to dignitaries. A large number were minted in silver for sale at $35 each, and an even larger number were minted in bronze for sale at $5. At the request of the city committee endorsed by the city commission, the U.S. Postal Service created a five cent postal stamp depicting a Spaniard in armor holding aloft a Spanish flag. In the margins of the postage stamp were printed the words, United States Postage, Settlement of Florida, 1565-1965. The date of issue was August 28, 1965. The Arivas House, first residence to be reconstructed, was dedicated by Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson on March 11, 1963. The Vice President visited the rest of North St. George Street, then in process of reconstruction and restoration, Mission Nombre de Dios, and the Ponce de Leon Hotel, as we pronounce that adventurer's name locally, where he attended a black tie dinner and stayed overnight. The following month, Mr. Harold Cooley, president of the Florida Chamber of Commerce, called me and asked if I would meet with President John F. Kennedy in Tampa on November 18th to explain to him the importance of St. Augustine in our nation's history and to invite him to visit the city for the purpose of gaining national exposure for the quadricentennial. I did meet with the president at MacDill Air Force Base showed him maps and documents in which he seemed to take great interest and conveyed the invitation that Mr. Cooley promoted. After some 15 minutes together, the president said, I'll keep in touch. <laughs> but four days later, he was dead. A nightly fiesta, Dias de España, began on North St. George Street in advance of the founding date, September 8, 1965, it featured folk dancers, strolling musicians, costume merrymakers, and sword fighters. Dozens of booths offered food, drink, and souvenirs. Sponsored by the St. Augustine JCs, the fiesta was called at the time the largest ever staged locally in modern years. Two construction accomplishments of the Preservation Commission were dedicated during this period. On September 4th, the Pan American Center was dedicated by Dr. Jose Mora, Secretary General of the OAS, and Ambassador Juan Plate, Chairman of the OAS Council. Both gentlemen acknowledged contributions to the project that had come from General Motors, Ford, Humble SO, Gulf, Texaco, AT&T, Pan American Airways, W.R. Grayson Company, and other industries doing business in Latin America. The majority of the building's interior space was devoted to an exhibition of modern art assembled from 18 of the Latin American countries. It was to be succeeded by exhibits of treasures from pre-Columbian Peru and of popular arts of Mexico. The United States was represented at the inaugural ceremonies by U.S. Senator Spencer L. Holland of Florida. About 1,000 local citizens attended. The next day, September 5, Lieutenant General 
Camilo Alonso Vega, Minister of the Interior in Spain, dedicated that country's Casa del Hidalgo, an Hispanic garden featuring a statue of Queen Isabel uh, connected the OAS and Spanish buildings. Other Spanish dignitaries present were Don Angel Sagas, Director General of North American Relations in the Foreign Office, uh, Ambassador to the United States, Marquez de Mary del Val, and Alvaro Armada, Conde de Revilla Gigedo of Gijón in Asturias, linear descendant of Pedro Menendez Aviles, and holder of the hereditary title of Adelantado de la Florida. The United States was represented by U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall. Final and solemn observance of the quadricentennial came on September 8, 1965, the actual founding day. Planned for that occasion was an outdoor mass of thanksgiving on the grounds of Mission Nombre de Dios at the approximate site given on Spanish maps where the 800-person landing party of Pedro Menendez worshipped exactly 400 years before. It was expected that 5,000 people would attend. Unfortunately, that day, St. Augustine was swept by the high winds and rain of a nor'easter, and services had to be transferred to the cramped confines of the nearby Mark W. Lance National Guard Armory. Still, for a comparative few, including foreign and domestic dignitaries, the anniversary mass was duly celebrated. Thanks to subventions offered by the St. Augustine Historical Society and the St. Augustine Foundation, a number of scholarly books and journal articles about the city's history were produced in the years 1962-65. I will not go into a list of their titles, but uh, when these pages are reproduced by Leslie, uh, you can see those titles for yourself. There were scholarly conferences connected to the quadricentennial, a Pan-American Symposium on Restoration and Preservation of Historic Monuments was held here in June 1965, attended by delegates from most of the Latin American countries. Joint sponsors were the National Trust, the Pan-American Union, and in name only, the National Quadricentennial Commission. There was a historical symposium on explorations and settlements in the Spanish borderlands, their religious motivations held on October 29th. Speakers included Father Maynard Geiger, uh, Franciscan uh, director of Old Mission Santa Barbara in California, uh, the Jesuit historian John Francis Bannon of St. Louis University, and Dr. Louis Hankey, uh, professor at Columbia University. <laughs> the popular press, newspapers, magazines, newsletters gave generous coverage to St. Augustine in 1965 and 66, but none so expansively as National Geographic. Its cover story of February 1966, titled St. Augustine, Nation's Oldest City Turns 400, covered 33 pages with seven original paintings and 19 photographs. Finally, it should be recalled that the quadricentennial events and observances took place against a backdrop of racial struggles in St. Augustine streets, motels, restaurants, and nearby beaches. Expecting to draw national attention for his campaign for civil rights legislation, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to the city in 1964, accompanied by non-resident African-American activists and led freedom marches through the downtown district. Unfortunately, the peaceful black demonstrators were physically confronted by white resistors, most from outside the city. A threat of truly serious violence hung over the community for many months, and a quadricentennial leadership that had sought positive national exposure for its anniversary plans instead watched St. Augustine demeaned and embarrassed on the evening newscasts of CBS, NBC, and ABC. In that extremity, I, as a member of the city committee, drafted a conciliatory statement titled, A Declaration of Goodwill, and together with Mr. Newton, presented it to Mayor Joseph Shelley. In his book, Racial Change and Community Crisis, historian David Colburn wrote that the declaration, uh, quote, 
decried the violence carried on by belligerent racists and the recalcitrance of local political leaders who seemed bent on prolonging the crisis. The document urged an end to the rancor and the beginning of a serious dialogue to ease the racial hostilities. Mayor Shelley refused to issue the statement or anything like it. On April 12th, 1964, and I only mention this because I'm a living witness, I went to the Ponce de Leon Motor Lodge uh, in North City, accompanied by three local African-American couples and integrated the dining room of the Ponce de Leon Motor Lodge. That all-white restaurant, one of the finest in or near St. Augustine, thereby became the first to accept black diners. I and my party were treated with genuine courtesy. Two more results of real and permanent good might be recognized in these remarks. Racial barriers in all other restaurants in the area collapsed one after the other in the wake of the Ponce de Leon decision. And Dr. King's longtime dream of a Civil Rights Act passed the Congress and was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson on July 2, 1964. As I take leave of these pages, I remind us that this has not been a tale of two cities. Instead, it has been a tale of one continuous city seen through the prisms of two periods of time, when she was born and when she was reborn. May St. Augustine continue her rise through the centuries and achieve her rightful place in the pantheon of American cities. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yes, I'll sit down <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to leave this with you. Thank you all. I hope you appreciate the way we started this conference. I don't think we could have topped this in any way, shape, or form. And I'm going to encourage Dr. Gannon to drink from the Fountain of Youth so that we can have him around for another 15 minutes. <laughs> He'll have even more good stories to tell. I do hope that you all fill out the evaluation forms. I hope that you have picked up brochures so that you can see that we will be back here again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Or listen to Dr. Timothy Johnson, who's in our front row here. We will also be here to, uh, throughout the day and then tomorrow evening again. Um, as referred to by Dr. Gannon, you will get to hear Dr. Jerry Malinich and Dr. Kathleen Deegan. So please come and bring your friends for that. Uh, also, we do have, again, the Cracker Cattle on St. George Street. We will have uh, Bob Stone from the Florida Cattlemen's Foundation come over and our Quip Popping Kids, which will be great fun as well. And obviously, Pedro Menendez and Juan Ponce de Leon will pop in and out themselves throughout the course of the weekend, so you might want to enjoy looking them up and posing for a few pictures. 
Does anybody have any questions that Dr. Gannon didn't answer? <laughs> trying to give him a break here since he talked longer than most of us possibly could have. Okay. I have one. Okay. The first Thanksgiving was here in St. Augustine. Yes. 